internet. Internet. A stream online. TNT Radio Live. Today's News Talk Radio. TNT. All right. I'm very excited. Our guest today is Kathy Vogan. Kathy is an incredibly talented uh, artist and musician, in addition to being an amazing independent journalist uh, and also the executive producer of CN Live, which is uh, the incredible consortium news uh, news program that they do, their live show that they do. Um, they're actually going to be co-hosting an event coming up here on January 29th in Sydney with Politics in the Pub, and it's called Saving Julian Assange. It's now or never. Uh, that is also going to be live streamed and recorded so that if you aren't able to make it in person, you You'll be able to check it out afterwards. We'll get into some of the uh, details about that later on in the show and dive into that. So, Kathy, thanks so much for being here. Hi, Misty. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. I love it when you're here, um, especially because, uh, you know, we are kind of reaching a critical point in the Assange case, as we've been talking about for uh, you know, some weeks now, but we have an official uh, court date, two official court dates, I guess, February 20th and 21st um, in London. Um, and this is really kind of the last attempt at preventing extradition, correct? Um, yes, it's supposed to be an appeal to overturn, hopefully, the decision, uh, the swift decision of Jonathan Swift to refuse leave for Julian Assange to appeal to the High Court. Now, things have happened in between, so there may be issues that come up. One very important thing that has happened, and this is something that Craig Murray wrote about in November in an article called The Supreme Court, Rwanda and Assange, and that's AAA versus the Secretary of State for the Home Department, or Home Secretary. And a big decision was taken there about assurances coming from a requesting country for extradition. Now, before it was up to the Home Secretary to decide if a country is safe for somebody to be extradited to. And um, usually that was based on a couple of diplomatic notes. And the Supreme Court has has decided that this is no longer the case, that these assurances must be tested in a court of law and thoroughly investigated. And so Craig Murray points out that this is highly relevant to the case of Julian Assange, because if you remember, after the court of first instance refused to extradite Julian Assange, the US appealed and the two judges on that panel, Burnett and Holroyd, said, okay, well, those assurances, even though when we read them, they were, you know, there was caveats in there. We can break this any time we like. But they decided it was fine and, and then overturned the whole decision. And in fact, at the time, the late John Pilger asked, well, what was the point of the whole extradition hearing, especially the testimony of four expert medical witnesses and also other witnesses, Yancy Ellis, Joel Sickler, for example, who testified as to the appalling conditions in United States prisons. It was on the basis of those two things, uh, mental health reasons and conditions in US prisons that Judge Vanessa Barreto decided not to extradite Julian Assange. Well, now, in fact, we can review that again. It should be reviewed because Julian Assange's health has further deteriorated. This was in 2021. It was three years ago, exactly, since she said, I'm not going to extradite him. And then the appeal came up and his health has really changed since then. And as a result of this decision that came down in the Supreme Court, where is no longer the place of a Home Secretary to decide and state that a country is safe, a group of Australian parliamentarians, and of course, in our parliament, there are over 70 representatives and senators who are in this group now. It's a support group, a Bring Assange Home group. They have written a letter to the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, and now they have demanded um, or requested, let's be nice about it. Um, (laughs) I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote, we are requesting that you undertake an urgent, thorough and independent assessment of the risks to Mr. Assange's health and welfare in the event he is extradited to the United States. Consistent with the decision in AAA, it appears to us 
that such independent investigation should include a close review of the risks to Mr. Assange's health, life and well-being through prolonged detention in one or more high security US detention facilities. And rightly so, because there was a distinction drawn in the US appeal between Julian Assange and Laurie Love, mm -hmm. uh, whom Justice, Lord Chief Justice Ian Burnett had refused to extradite on health grounds. And at the time he said, well, Laurie Love is suffering from a physical condition as well. Now that was the very day that Julian had the stroke. Yeah. And it was, oh, how long was that? About nine weeks later that the decision was announced. And then I think just two days after that, we got the news that Julian had a stroke. But this distinction that Burnett made between Assange and Love it was never reviewed. It's never been reviewed in a court of law. And this is a very clever letter to Cleverly uh, requesting it's one of the best things that the Australian parliamentarians have done, because now they have requested this investigation. And let's remember, they want it to be independent. So that is going to trigger the testing of the US assurances, we hope. I'm not sure, but it may come down to another hearing in the Supreme Court. We have yeah. the, the High Court. Um, it's a kind of a review of Swift's Kurt and somewhat glib. Let's use the word glib because yes. uh, Craig Murray, uh, my favorite phrase in that article he wrote, uh, because Swift was involved in the Rwandan decision, which was overturned, um, he says that the Supreme Court may have twigged Swift as a glib little wanker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love Craig Murray. I love Craig Murray. He is like <laughs> the the amount of snark that he manages to get into his articles, and he's so he's just so witty and clever. I love like he's just fantastic. So okay, listen, we have to take a quick break and get some headlines. But you're right. I think that this is um, super interesting. Now, are they going to care? Is it going to? Are they? Uh, we, who knows? But at the very least, I think that this is um, a, a little glimmer of hope. So uh, we'll dive into some more of these details uh, right after this here on TNT. All right. We are here with Kathy Vogue and we're talking about the uh, Julian Assange case, which um, is really in a crunch time moment. There are two new court dates uh, in February, February 20th and 21st. If you are, it's in London, Royal Courts of Justice. If you are anywhere near London, please get to the court if you can. Um, there's going to be rallies taking place. I believe everybody intends to gather outside the court um, around 8.30, and we need as many people there as humanly possible to send a message. Um, so if you can get there, please get there. There will be uh, other events taking place globally. I know that there will be taking stuff in D.C., Boston, Denver, Seattle, um, uh, other places, uh, Tulsa, other places here in the States. So try to find an event near you and get out there and show support in whatever way that you can. So um, we were just talking about this uh, newest level Letter from members of the Australian Parliament, and as Kathy was just saying, this this is an interesting prospect, and I think that um, it's good to have some maybe a little cautious optimism here. Um, but what's so frustrating to me about this whole situation and about these so-called assurances is that Kathy. United States assurances, really? Who takes that seriously? Oh, we promise we're going to be nice to him. We we promise. Pinky swear. It's just so absurd on its face. The idea that. Not to mention the United States has been revealed to have been plotting to murder him. So the idea that there is even a consideration um, from any court, from any judge anywhere on planet Earth to extradite this man to a country that was revealed to be plotting to assassinate him is so beyond my ability to comprehend. And it just, I think, lays bare the height of corruption that has uh, been per pervasive in, the, in this entire situation. But you seem to think that there's reason to be uh, a little bit optimistic here. Obviously, Craig Murray has a little glimmer of hope as well. Um, it, what can we expect from this? When can we expect some kind of uh, reply to this? Uh, I'm not familiar with how cleverly works or any of that stuff. What do you, where, where do you think this is going? Well, as I said, uh, this is supposed to be just a review of Swift's decision not to hear a high court appeal after Burnett and Holroyd decided to overturn the lower court decision not to extradite. And uh, that appeal, if it goes forward and it is permitted, we don't know who the judges are going to be. Let's hope it's not the same too. But yeah. um, 
it should be about all of the other points that Baretsa, Judge Baretsa, agreed with the United States or the Crown on. So the only one where she said no, I am not going to extradite him on health grounds. You see, there was all those other points that they made. And you bring up the assassination attempt. There has been lots of things that have happened since yeah. then. But also there's the whole UC Global case. And now that's, <laughs> we've found out since in a Spanish court. And now in the United States, there's a Fourth Amendment case that's going forward with the Roth law firm. Um, we now know that there was breach of attorney-client privilege as well. That is a very grave matter. I mean, that's another thing that should get the case thrown out of court. There are many different things. And we would love Assange to have his say. But at the same time, my God, he's been in Belmarsh for five years now. And, yeah. you, you know, you can't... You can't expect a human being to wait their whole lifetime to be given permission to just say, excuse me, but uh, you know, the, what's been done here is terribly wrong. Now, the other thing that is really important, if you read the 150 page submission to the High Court from Assange's defence team, led, uh, supervised by Gareth Pierce, I might add, you will find out that there are a number of cases where the US deceived the UK court on the core facts of the case. I won't go into those details, but you know, all of that comes under the category of uh, Zakruski abuse. So the evidence has to be truthful, it has to be fair, it has to, you know, so there's all of that where the whole thing was misrepresented. So it would be good, the world would love to hear that and Julian battle for the free press. But the point is that our Australian Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, it's very rare that they agree on something. I can't even think of another major case where something as controversial as, as Julian's case was in the past, they are absolutely in agreement and there's 70 parliamentarians that are just terribly concerned about Julian's health at this stage. And we have to understand that his life is slipping away. Yes. So, you know, and I think that the other thing is that even from a political point of view, it would be a good move for the Biden administration. Yes. Biden's popularity has plummeted due to wars that are going on and, and, and other domestic issues. And you have a, you know, a similar thing happening in the UK, that it would be you know, a relief to all of us if Julian was just uh, given his life back again and sent back to his young family. Yeah, hundred percent, and that's. Um, I think that people need to. We need to really uh, impress upon people how dire Julian's situation is. His health has been declining for many years now. Stella was just not Stella Assange. His wife was just recently on the Jimmy Dore show, um, which was being guest hosted by my friend Russell. Um, and they asked about Julian's condition, and she said it's difficult to answer that question because it varies from day to day. But his health has been declining for a very long time, and I think that what people really need to think about is that he's being held in indefinite detention, which means there's no end game. He, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. He has no idea when this situation will come to a conclusion. And that is a, a, another addition to the torturous aspect of this, because if you can just imagine being in a high security prison for nearly five years now, as Kathy just mentioned, and you have no idea when or if that will ever end or when or if you will ever get to um, speak your piece or have a voice or any of that, I think that that is incredibly difficult to deal with. Um, and so not only is his health declining, physically as you mentioned he had the mini stroke um he has had a, a whole barrage of health issues over the years from shoulder issues to tooth uh issues um he was unable to get adequate health care for many years while he was in the embassy um but also his mental condition has been declining for a very long time as i think anyone would expect when you are dealing with um you know, prolonged isolation um, and really uh, just terrible conditions. So we have to take another quick break, uh, but we're going to get into um, some more uh, details here on these court cases coming up right after this here on today's News Talk. Misty Winston on today's News Talk Radio TNT.
All right, we are here with Kathy Vogan from the Incredible Consortium News. I know I talk about them all the time on the show. I'm going to do it again. Uh, they are fantastic. Some of the best work that is being done out there. Please go and support them however you're able. There's not enough praise to heap upon them. So uh, we're here talking about the Julian Assange case. So you were just talking about um, uh, that Julian would like to have a voice. And I'm curious, do you know, is he going to be permitted to attend the two court dates in February? Is he going to be allowed to attend in person? Do you know? Oh, I wouldn't know that, but, um, you know, he hasn't been allowed to attend in person for a very long time now. I know. Um, and if you're a courtroom journalist, I've been live tweeting from the courtroom. You can see him on a monitor. Uh, he's just in a room that connects to the prison. So he's not physically in court. And it's hard to tell whether the judges can actually see him. If they can, then, as Mary Postakidis pointed out, it's absolutely scandalous that they didn't halt the proceedings the day that he had this mini stroke because, my right. God, he looked so ill. We knew he was absolutely almost fatally ill. Mary called me and said, what the hell is wrong with him? He keeps falling over and yeah. he can't, can't hold his head up. And his his face was ashen and his eyes were kind of rolling back in his head. I mean, who wouldn't know? That something I know it's terribly wrong. I remember that day, Kathy, because literally everybody, Kevin Gastola, Mary Kostakidis, every journalist who was in the courtroom and was seeing him on screen, everybody was talking about how awful he looked. He looks so uh, sick. He looks like he's about to pass out. And uh, it, it was just breaking my heart because... Um, you know, it, and it was, it was so frustrating about that day and that situation was as he is sitting there in a tiny room uh, in Belmarsh where he's being forced to participate in his own trial via video link, which is absurd. Um, he's in a fight for his life and they won't even allow him to attend his own uh, hearings in person. But in the courtroom, as he is sitting there in this tiny room in Belmarsh having a mini stroke, the prosecution is in the courtroom calling him a malingerer, saying he's faking it to avoid uh, accountability. I It's my Mind you couldn't write that. I mean, it is just, oh, it's so frustrating, Kathy. It's so frustrating. Yeah, well, that's what would really do your head in because yeah. if, you're, if you're a bit confused that the defense was insisting that he would, that's what the argument was about, his likelihood of committing suicide. So therefore, to prove his integrity, he would have to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy or it's an insane argument yes or die yeah. and i think honestly i think that that they would like for him to die in prison i think that that would be a very easy way for them to everybody to just wash their hands of it oh oh no look at that that's terrible what a tragedy and then everybody would move about their day um and i mean it's i think it's very easy for those of us who um are admirers of assange to um think that he is somewhat superhuman due to everything that he's been able to withstand but we need to remember he is just a man and he has been uh, he has had to withstand so much over the course of the past decade plus. Um, this is not just the nearly five years in Belmarsh. It's the years that he spent in the Ecuadorian embassy and the years that he was uh, being detained in some way, shape, form or fashion in the time before that. So this is really, as you just said, his life is slipping away. He has uh, had to sacrifice over a decade of his life, over a decade of time. I mean, if you just think about if I if I think back to everything I've done in the past decade, um, and I realize that that's been stolen from him. It makes me incredibly angry uh, that he is being uh, punished in this way, simply for telling the truth. That's all that he did was publish truthful information. What a tragedy. Well, Terrible. That's, that's right. Um, uh, well, well, let's not forget that in the first five years that he was in the Ecuadorian embassy under the presidency of Rafael Correa, he was uh, Fidel Nalvez, who was first secretary at the Ecuadorian embassy, um, tells us that, you know, it, the, it wasn't easy being uh, confined and he wasn't getting any sunlight, but he was able to keep working and there were lots of people that went to visit. But then gradually when President Moreno took over, the staff at the embassy were changed and they just started getting more and more draconian. Um, Stella Assange describes it as a black site. It became like a black site. A lot of this is described, in fact, the whole thing is described in the book by Nils Melser, The Trial of Julian Assange. And I think that's very worth reading. I think a lot of yes. people have now to get the, the finer details. For example, that there were 50 violations of due process in Sweden alone in yes. order to ensnare him. 
and get him over there. And then they had a temporary surrender treaty going with the United States to bounce him across there to the United States. I mean, that's why he went to the embassy in the first place. Um, he got word of where he was headed for. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was very, very harsh conditions there that were awaiting him in Sweden. And that was all completely trumped up. I mean, it's disgraceful that even a witness testimony was tampered with a police person, Melly Kranz. She signed, she signed this statement from a witness who had only just begun to talk and then she realized what they were trying to do and, and, mm -hmm. and, and took off. And they fabricated evidence. They spoke to the press when that's absolutely, the police did when it's absolutely against the law to do that when and the whole world was convinced that there were charges there in sweden and it never went beyond a preliminary investigation which was absolutely fruitless had to be dropped in the end because there was just no evidence that any of this had happened it was just a yeah. ploy a ploy to there's get just them. been so many things in this whole situation i mean we've mentioned just a few of them the obvious the trumped up stuff in sweden we mentioned the uc global case where literally the cia co-opted a security firm from spain uh, and turned it into essentially a spying operation where they were recording uh conversations with julian assange and all of his visitors including and i know we touched on this briefly but i think it needs to be repeated they were spying on conversations with his legal team that is an unbelievable Unbelievable violation of his rights. I, the idea that that alone isn't enough to have this case lit on fire is astonishing to me. Um, we mentioned the assassination plots that, that that were developed at the highest levels of the Trump administration. I mean, there's just been so many things and so many violations of his rights that it is. It, it really is astonishing to me that this has been allowed to continue, that this is able to continue, and that there isn't more public outcry about it. I mean, we are starting to see support for Assange grow, which has been kind of a, a slow buildup. I think that you know we're 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 seeing that. Obviously, as you mentioned, there's a massive group of parliamentarians in Australia uh, who are now supportive of Assange, and that is in no small part thanks to the incredible activists on the ground there um, who have done a phenomenal job of lobbying those politicians, of reaching out to them, of putting pressure on them, of making it an election issue, of making it an issue of importance in Australian politics. Which and they they don't get enough. The, the activists over there don't get enough uh, credit in my opinion um but it's just it's uh, uh, to me it's just so i'm impatient <laughs> and it seems very slow um and as you said as we've been talking about julian's health has been in decline for some time now and i'm just not sure how much he can take uh and it, I, I it's just i would very much like to see him home kathy that's all i'm trying to say that's i would like to see him home yeah and i think we'd like to see him working again he has won around 30 major awards for journalism. I mean, yes. you've even had these people trying to say, this guy's not a journalist, <laughs> you know? Yeah. He's won our equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize in Australia. He's won a Walkley Award, but he's also won so many, just about every award. He's the most highly awarded journalist in history. Yes. How many awards has Rupert Murdoch won? None. <laughs> Zero. No, he gives them out to his stuff. What do you think? Because what you just said is 100% true. Julian Assange is absolutely a journalist. There is no debate about that. He is a card carrying member of two, I think, two different journalist unions. Um, he's an honorary member of some others. He's won dozens of journalism awards. He, WikiLeaks, as far as I know, is the only news organization on planet Earth who has a 100% record of accuracy. Yeah. I, I don't know. That seems pretty journalistic to me. Uh, but the Committee to Protect Journalists just recently refused to add him to their list of detained journalists. And when Kevin Gastola reached out to them, they said he's not a a journalist what the heck kathy <laughs> well you know i remember i think it might have been craig murray who said that judges read the newspapers too and probably these people who run these organizations read the newspapers as well and there's been so much misinformation fed to journalists i mean this doesn't just happen in relation to assange it, it happens in relation to wars, for yes. example, as well. First casualty is truth. So these are things that people have heard over the last decade. And one of the jobs of uh, activists, but also journalists who have taken on this case and want to 
know the truth about what happened, writers as well. That's kind of like three quarters of the job to try and get it to percolate down so that people like that who run these organizations, who, who knows who they are, if they're really paying attention. And let's face it, there isn't enough known about Julian Assange in the United States. Yeah. Information about him has been kept out or else falsified. But I believe you've got a resolution 934 yeah. that has been started in the United States. So there, for example, that resolution, this whole business about him having aided Chelsea Manning to obtain this information, that has been called, I think, fabled nonsense in this resolution because, of course, in court it has been amply demonstrated. And in fact, it was demonstrated in Manning's court martial back mm -hmm. in 2012 that that was patent nonsense. But there had to be some kind of hook to enable these espionage charges. Otherwise, you know, as Biden said back in 2011, if the information was just dropped on a journalist's lap, they would just be a regular journalist that you couldn't, you couldn't convict them of anything. My God, that would be a disaster. And actually, I don't know if you know this, but in the 150 page High Court appeal that uh, Justice Swift rejected. It is mentioned there that at the very last moment, the US prosecution dropped that accusation that Julian had aided and abetted Manning. So that's, yeah. yeah, that's actually something that I didn't know until I read that appeal, that they had actually disavowed that opinion that that's what happened. That was a narrative that they invented in order to help Manning be anonymous. Um, this is rubbish because Manning had nothing to do with WikiLeaks before. Nearly all of it, except for the State Department cables, had been uploaded to the WikiLeaks website and Manning had top secret clearance already. Yeah. So why, yeah. why would she need a, any help whatsoever? And I was also told that she was a, a crack technician and often helping the others there in the place where she was working. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about the event on Monday. Yes, please. Yes, I was just um, going to do that. Because uh, one very important speaker that we have is Jennifer Robinson. So that's Julian Assange's lawyer. You asked for more details on what is upcoming. So Jennifer may well be able to fill us in and give us a, a better idea of what's going to happen on February 20th and 21st. We also have Senator David Shoebridge, who is one of the four co-signatories of the letter to the UK Home Secretary, James Cleverly. He has been a very strong voice for uh, yes getting Assange home. He was one of the DC six, the six Australian politicians who went to Washington late last year. So we will hear a lot more from Shoebridge as well. Plus I'm going to do an interview next week with him and Josh Wilson, another Australian politician, but this one is a member of the government. So they're both going to talk more about this letter to the UK Home Secretary and what the Australian politicians are asking for, and rightly so. And Mary Kostakidis, who was uh, really the face of primetime news for 20 years in Australia on our international channel, SBS. She is still a journalist and still writing away. Mary also was one of the two people who awarded Julian the Sydney Peace Medal for exceptional courage and initiative in the pursuit of human rights. So she is going to be talking. If anybody knows the Assange case, Mary does. I think she's yes. been following it since 2006 when WikiLeaks started. The other person who gave that award is Stuart Reese. We're going to have Stuart Reese as well. He's going to be giving a short introduction. We have Dr. Arthur Chesterfield Evans, who is one of the doctors for Assange, and I feel it's quite important that we have him speak as well in order to clarify for people what would happen to Julian Assange if he were in, say, ADC in Alexandria and he had a major stroke. 
well, basically he's dead meat. You have to get him into a sophisticated operating room within three hours or else, you know, it's just forget it. Kathy, listen, we're almost out of time. I'm sorry to have to interrupt you. Joe Loria is also going to be speaking at this event. That's right. Please, yes. Yeah, please. And I love Joe. He's fantastic. Please go to politicsinthepub.org.au or consortiumnews.com. You can find out more information there. Again, this is going to be on January 29th. So please check that out. Kathy, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome back anytime, of course. Um, as Julian Assange says, learn, challenge, act now. And don't go anywhere. Timothy Shays right after this here on today's News Talk.